Caro Blaster does an excellent job of blending arcade style satisfaction with modern design sensibilities. What I mean is, it doesn't waste your time, but it still usually does the typical thing of introducing a threat before it becomes a real danger. Often this is done right after screen transitions like this little puddle of mud you'll almost certainly be snagged by. Here you can see a nice example where the light fixture falls on top of the bookshelf, but more importantly notice how the next one isn't a full screen away or something, it's just a few pixels to the right. While this increases the likelihood of oblivious players getting crushed, it's still well within the realm of fair and crucially means that repeat playthroughs aren't bogged down with tutorialising. This kind of design pattern is accepted as good practice by now, but so many games get that second part wrong. They draw out the tutorial steps to the point where the pace would have actually improved by just dumping explanations into an optional text-heavy monstrosity instead. At least that way it wouldn't ruin every subsequent playthrough as well. Carol Blaster keeps this rapid progression and escalation up for its entire runtime, giving it a lot of replay value, and this constantly evolving level design is just one of its merits. Compared to similar games, it feels like the run and gun with a more tactical slant. This genre descends from arcades, where timers were ubiquitous. When every second was a chance for the machine to earn more revenue, a player couldn't just be allowed to stand still indefinitely. Often this materialised as a literal countdown, but it could also be seen in the way enemies would spawn to ambush the player, even if they stood in one place. Caro Blaster drops that mentality, allowing for more relaxed progression, with boss fights being an obvious exception. The weapon selection synergises well with this slower pace, offering opportunities for thoughtful use through their differing arcs and properties. At times the right gun feels a little too exploitable, but at least enemies will always retaliate on hit, which saves many encounters from becoming a complete cakewalk. Each weapon gets a chance to shine, but the flamethrower does seem underutilised compared to the others. A few more uphill sections would have made it a more viable option. The spread gun also seems too dominant in the middle stretches, but thankfully the laser upgrade brings the blaster back into contention. If anything, there's an argument to be made that most weapons are a little overpowered, but even though the difficulty level is quite low compared to many similar games, there's one tiny feature which goes a long way towards encouraging mastery, the jacket. Cave Story punished players for taking damage by de-leveling their weapons, but Caro Blaster uses a permanent upgrade system instead. You might say that losing a piece of bonus health pales in comparison to lowered weapon power since its effect is much less mechanically severe, but players are already mechanically incentivized not to take damage in just about every game. Caro Blaster provides a narrative reason to stay safe since few of us want to deprive our little frog dude of a warm, stylish jacket. Now avoiding damage is incentivized in two different ways, and this second motivation might resonate better with the kind of players drawn to the cutesy graphics or relaxed pace. Only in the last stretch do those graphics prove to be somewhat deceptive, as the difficulty continues to grow until the final stage which acts as a spectacular climax despite how little build-up it gets. Every previous enemy is mixed together and packed into a tighter space, making for a more dynamic and challenging arrangement. This concept of giving gameplay elements one last chance to shine before the finale isn't new, but I've rarely seen it typified so well. Maybe one reason for that is because the level design seems to let go of its meticulousness here, embracing the kind of chaos which stands a better chance of overwhelming a seasoned player. At its most fundamental, a run and gun is really all about avoiding overlapping enemy and projectile behaviours. There's few better ways of putting that to the test than just mixing them together haphazardly for the finale. This is one of the few mistakes made by hard mode. It introduces a different final stage, which provides a decent challenge, but with more homogenous enemy types it feels less chaotic and climactic than before. Some of the harder bosses also cross a line where damage seems unavoidable at times, although maybe specific setups can alleviate that problem. Apart from those minor missteps, Zangyo mode stands out as another example of Caro Blaster doing a common thing uncommonly well. What might just be a flat damage increase in a lesser game is instead filled with remixed stage layouts, remixed enemy layouts, new boss attacks, new enemy types, and even a couple of minor new mechanics. All of these changes put a meaningful enough spin on Caro Blaster to essentially classify it as two short but sweet games in one. While neither half of this package has a particularly engaging story, you get the sense it does hold some significance for the author considering the subject matter. Perhaps a more literary analysis could peel back the cartoony layer to reveal a more specific message about the perils of overtime, but I was content enough to take it at its admittedly bizarre and charming surface level. If I had to find fault with Caro Blaster, it would only be for a lack of ambition. You're not going to see anything fundamentally new or inventive here. 
In an industry plagued with overwork in a game about that very same topic, maybe there's a relevant point here, because in spite of that shortcoming, it's still a great game. As long as it's made to a high enough standard, there's room for simple but satisfying titles out there. Carol Blaster more than meets the cutoff, making it something well worth clocking in for.